is worship? How do we practice it? And does worship really matter? These are just some of the questions we're going to look at in this week's study. Hi, my name is Reverend Dor Comis. I'm coming to you from Faith Community Church, and I want to welcome you to our online midweek Bible study. So does worship really matter to God? You know, church, it really, really does. And because it does, worship should truly matter to us. You see, this week we're going to look at the protocol of worship, how we approach God and why that is important. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to please open up to the Gospel of John. Now the word worship in the Hebrew literally means to be bent or to be bowed over. The very idea of worship is linked to value and connection. You see, we worship what we value. We worship what we are connected to. Whatever that is, whatever has a hold on us. In other words, church, worship is about what we love and what we live for. How we approach worship tells us a lot about how we are seeing ourselves before a holy and mighty God how much we value his supremacy, how intimate our relationship with him truly is, how close we might feel to him or not, how indifferent or not we feel about the need to worship him. Church, I want you to know my hope for us this week, through this study in the weeks ahead, that we're going to walk away knowing, truly knowing from our heart, that worship matters. Well, first and foremost, we must understand that worship matters to God because he is the one, beloved, the only one who truly is deserving of our worship. Secondly, it matters to us because worshiping God is the reason why you and I were created. And that's why it's so important that we take time to think about how and why we worship God. You see, it's important that we understand God is almighty. Say that. God is almighty. And there is a protocol, beloved, in worshiping him. He is deserving of a worship that honors him and gives him the glory that he's due. So it is important the way in which we approach God because the way in which we approach God really reflects how we view God. Do we give him the honor that he deserves? Do we worship him the way that his word teaches us to worship him? Do we enter his gates with thanksgiving? Do we come into his courts with praise? Amen? Beloved, you must understand, we must understand that worship that is insincere, worship that is not from the heart in God's eyes is vain, it's useless, and it is unacceptable to him. Now, I know there are some of you who might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Reverend Dorr, are you telling me that God really, really cares about how I worship him? Well, let's look at the words of Jesus. In Mark chapter 7, verse 6, he tells us this people, speaking of the old covenant people, the chosen people, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, worshiping from the heart was important to God. It was important to Jesus. And you know, if we're honest, all of us can admit that there have been times when we have entered into worship, just going through the motions and not really being present in the moment in which we're supposed to be giving God all honor and praise. Now, Jesus gives us the kind of worship that God is looking for, the protocol, so to speak, in the Gospel of John chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, as I said, we're right now going to look at the Gospel of John, and we're going to begin in chapter 4. Here, we find Jesus at Jacob's well, and he encounters a Samaritan woman. 
And speaking with Jesus, she brings up the subject of worship. Verse 20 tells us, she says to him, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place that we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we know, or rather we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23, look at this. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse 24, he goes on to explain why. He says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, it's important to know Samaritans and Jews had different beliefs as to where one should worship. You see, the, Ma the Samaritans believed that uh, they should worship on Mount Gerizim. And Jews understood that it was supposed to be in Jerusalem. And Jesus now approaching this woman says that there's a time that was coming for a different kind of worship. A new protocol was coming where worship would not be defined any longer by a geographical place. That true worshipers would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus tells us in verse 24 the reason why. Because God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now I want you to notice the emphasis on the word must here. And this means that any other way, beloved, is unacceptable before God. So God has given us a protocol in worshiping him. In other words, beloved, we're going to call it, if we're going to call it worship, then it must be done according to God's ways. Or what we're engaged in truly isn't worship at all, at least not by God's standards. So what does it mean to worship the Father in spirit and truth? That's what I really want us to focus on on this week's lesson. Many say to worship God in spirit is to worship from the heart. Now, the reality is there's some truth to that. But that would imply that any person who worship from the heart can please God as long as their worship is sincere. In other words, God would be obligated to receive a person's worship simply based on a person's sincerity. Now, some also say to worship God in truth is to worship as he directs in his word. Now, that's really true. We know that to be true. We're going to see it in the Old Testament and New Testament that God, God's word is truth and that we need to uh, abide by the truth laid out in his word when we approach him and when we worship him. But you have to understand that in John chapter 4, Jesus is not really saying anything new here. He's not giving us a wow factor if all he means is that we should be worshiping him uh, from the heart and worshiping him according to the word. What I want you to see here, beloved, in John chapter 4, is that Jesus is making a distinct contrast concerning the protocol of worship that was and the protocol of worship that he said had not yet come, but was coming and now is. You see, I believe that Jesus wants us to see that a contrast is being made between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship. You see, the Jews had worshiped correctly by going to Jerusalem. 
In God's eyes, Samaritan worship was no worship at all because they had not followed the proper protocol. He said in verse 22, you worship what you do not know. Your worship is in vain. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, the Jews knew that God had built the temple through Solomon and that the temple was in Jerusalem. And by God's order, beloved, worship was to be carried out in that temple. God, God ordained it to be so. Why? Because God ordained it to be so. Because God said so. Because God, by his Holy Spirit, understand, was present in that temple. When God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle in the desert, God's presence was there. Say this, worship is all about the presence. If you don't have the presence, guess what? You don't have true worship. Worship is about the presence. We worship where God is. Amen. And God was present in the temple and God was present in the tabernacle in the wilderness. You see, when God, as I said, instructed Moses to build that tabernacle in the desert, his presence was, presence was there. It was in the Holy of Holies, and it was hidden behind a thick temple veil. And you have to understand the definition of that word thick. That veil, beloved, was four inches long, four inches wide, rather. It was four inches uh, thick. This, this, the thickness of this veil is very significant. It created a thick barrier between the temple priest, the high priest, and the people of God and the presence of God. And only the high priest was able to enter into that holy place. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where God's presence was. And you have to understand also that this presence, beloved, was tangible. It could be felt. It could be seen. It is described in the Bible as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It was experienced by the people, the presence of the Almighty God in that tabernacle. Now, you need to know later on that same Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Temple of Solomon and the glory of the Lord was in the temple. Jesus in John 4, speaking prophetically, tells this Samaritan woman that the day is coming when worshiping God will not be limited by a geographical location. Worshiping God will no longer be limited to a temple built by bricks and stones. He said the time was coming and now is when the geographical place would be not important any longer. Why? Because Jesus knew after he shed his blood on Calvary, amen, that temple veil, that four inch thick veil was going to be torn in two, hallelujah. And the blood of Jesus would make a way for you and I to enter into the holy place. So whether you live in St Staten Island or beloved, you live in Timbuktu, it doesn't matter. The geographical place would no longer matter because God was about to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Amen. John chapter four, verse 23 said, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers, notice he's making a distinction here. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Jesus is telling this woman, even though the Jews under the old covenant had the location right, somehow Old Testament worship had not yet been in spirit 
and in truth. And we know that worshiping in spirit couldn't simply mean to worship from the heart because even under the old covenant, beloved, God had required worship from the heart from the Jews. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 7, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with, your, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So we, we understand in John chapter 4, it couldn't mean simply worshiping from the heart to worship in spirit because it wasn't anything new. This was already required by God. And it appears by Jesus' words that God is looking for something more. I'd like you to turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Now, in this passage, God rebukes his covenant children regarding their worship. And let's take a look at what really disturbed God. Isaiah chapter 1, and I'm going to begin at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Says the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of the he goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? In other words, church, God is saying, who told you that you could come into my courts in this manner with your feet only and your hearts are far from me? He says in verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Can you just sense God's frustration here? Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Could you imagine? He's even saying, when you lift up your hands to me, it's meaningless when your heart isn't involved, beloved. He said, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yes, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. But he doesn't leave them there. In verse 18, after disclosing to them from verses 10 through 17, the condition of their hearts and the condition of their worship, that their worship was unacceptable to him because their hearts were not clean. Their hearts were not pure. He tells them in verse 18, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet. They shall be white as snow. They, uh, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, beloved, see your sinful condition. But no, there is a day coming when your sins, though they be as scarlet, will one day be made white as snow. So we see, beloved, that even in the Old Covenant, God was concerned about the condition of the heart. God required worship from the heart. And God always required worship in accordance with his word. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 32 and 33 says, You shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you 
and that it may be and that it may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. So through these verses and many more in the Bible, we see that God always required worship from the heart. So then, what does Jesus mean in John chapter 4 when he says God is looking for a worship, those who will worship him, he's seeking such who will worship him in spirit and in truth. What does this mean? Beloved, I want you to know, worshiping God in spirit. Jesus is telling us here, there is coming a worship that would be spiritual in nature, that would be in contrast to the form of worship that was considered primarily physical in nature. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now again, in keeping with the context, Jesus is clearly telling us that there was coming a new protocol to worshiping God that would be according to God's spirit nature, not man's physical nature. Because God is spirit, beloved, he must receive worship that is spiritual in its nature. So God desired a worship birthed from man's heart, not a worship that was outward by man's performance. In other words, Jesus was telling this Samaritan woman that a worship was coming that was more in keeping with God's own nature. Only those, beloved, who were born of God's spirit would be able to offer this kind of worship that God required. For the Father, he said, is seeking such to worship him. He's making a distinction. Who is he referring to? Who are the such? Beloved, it is those who are born again of God's spirit. The kind of worship God requires could only be accompanied through the ministry of Jesus Christ. It could only be accomplished through him. Jesus, beloved, made the way for you and I to worship God in a worthy manner. Oh, someone better shout hallelujah. You see, apart from him, beloved, the Bible teaches us we can do nothing. Apart from him, we cannot offer God the kind of worship that God requires. Apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you and, Evan, you and I could never enter the holy place of God's presence. You see, without Jesus, you and I would be still dancing outside the veil. Jesus made worship in the spirit possible. Beloved, I want you to know you can experience the kind of worship we're talking about tonight by coming to the cross of Christ, by repenting of your sin, by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and allowing his Holy Spirit to cause you to be born again. You have to understand, beloved, in the Old Testament, this type of worship was not possible. Sin separated us from God's presence. Old Testament worship was focused on the external. It was all about the law of Moses. It was all that the law of Moses could provide. I'd like you to please turn to Hebrews chapter 9. The writer of Hebrews helps us to understand the protocol of old covenant worship. You see, this was a worship, beloved, that was focused on the external physical elements. And these physical elements that are outlined for us in Hebrews chapter 9, it's important you know, 
All of these physical elements that were part of old covenant worship all pointed to Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9 verse uh, 1 tells us, Then verily the first covenant, meaning Old Testament, had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary, meaning a sanctuary on earth as opposed to a heavenly one. It's referring here to the order of Old Testament worship, which followed a certain protocol that the writer of Hebrews is about to describe to us. Look at verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made. Now he's referring here to the tabernacle that was made by Moses when the Israelites were wandering in the desert. And he goes on now telling us that all the furniture that was found in that tabernacle had a specific meaning in their worship. The first we're in, speaking of this furniture, was the candlestick and the table and the showbread which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. So the tabernacle was divided into these various sections. The candlestick, or more accurately translated lampstand, is in a practical sense the only means of light when you entered the holy place. Now this lampstand, which was the only source of light, was beaten out of one solid piece of pure gold. It wasn't pieced together. It was handcrafted and pounded and beaten out of pure gold. It didn't burn candles, beloved. It was fueled by oil. Now, oil in the Bible is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And you have to know, this lampstand was absolutely beautiful in its design. It consisted of a central shaft and six branches, three on one side and three on the other, seven in all. Under the Old Covenant, the lampstand was the way or lit the way to God's presence in a very real physical sense. In John chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen? Beloved, you have to know, under the new covenant, Jesus, the light of the world, now lights the way to God's presence in a very real and tangible spiritual sense. Also in verse 2, in Hebrews chapter 9, the writer of Hebrews tells us about the table of showbread. The table of showbread was a rectangular table made out of wood that was covered in gold. And it was to be continually filled with bread. The table of showbread served as a reminder of God's desire to have intimate fellowship with us each and every day. It is God's way, beloved, of saying, come, dine with me. Come and feast upon the bread of my presence. Amen. Under the new covenant, Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Amen? Beloved, did you know that the city where Jesus was born, Bethlehem, literally means the house of bread? The bread of life was born in the house of bread. Not only that, the Bible shows us that he was born in a manger. A manger, beloved, is a feeding trough. It's a place where animals fed from. You see, the bread of life came down to earth that we may feed upon him. Beloved, God desires for you and I to feast at the table of his presence each and every day. And Jesus' sacrifice made that possible for you and me. You see, even under the Old Testament, God set forth this pattern of worship. 
Now, within the tabernacle of Moses were different areas, as I said. First, there was the outer court. Now, the outer court was the outer border of the tabernacle. It was the area that was fenced in. It was like a fenced in area. Picture a, a big court and this outer court was fenced in all around. It was a place of cleansing and a place of atonement where the priests would make animal sacrifices for the atonement of sin. Second, there was the holy place, referring to here in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 2, as the sanctuary where we find the candlestick representing the light of Christ and the table of showbread representing Jesus as the bread of life showing us that it is Jesus who lights the way to God's presence and it is Jesus to whom we are to feed upon. Take a look now at Hebrews chapter 9 verse 3. And after the second veil, the holy tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which is the holy of holies, and it goes on to tell us what was contained in the Holy of Holies. What I want you to see here is the word tabernacle, tabernacle literally means to dwell. You see, God promised, I will be your God and you will be my people and I will dwell or tabernacle in your midst. Amen. So the Old Testament model of the tabernacle was a symbol of what God desired from the beginning of time, beloved, and that was to dwell with us. The tabernacle was more than just a dwelling place. It was a type and shadow of the kind of worship Jesus said would come as a result of his sacrifice, the kind of worship he spoke about in John chapter 4. We looked at what Jesus meant when he taught us what or how true worshipers would worship God when he said they would worship in spirit. We, we realized that it, it's not just a, a matter of having sincerity of heart. It's a matter of having a new heart, a brand new heart that only comes when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, confessing our sin before him and allowing his blood to make our sin the reddest scarlet, white as snow. Now, what did he mean, though, when he said that they must also worship him in truth. As I said, immediately many think he must have meant to worship God according to his word. After all, John 17 teaches us that God's word is truth. While that is most certainly true, beloved, we need to remember that in his conversation with this Samaritan woman, Jesus in John chapter 4 was making a contrast between an Old Testament protocol and a New Testament protocol that was to come. And now is, he said, because he had come. God had told Moses to build the tabernacle exactly the way he commanded. You see, you have to understand this holy, sacred space, whether we discuss the tabernacle of Moses or the temple of Solomon, both these sacred spaces were not man's idea. They were God's idea. And we know this through what God had spoken to Moses when he said in Exodus chapter 25, verse 9, make this tabernacle and all of its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. So from the most minute detail, beloved, God expected Moses to build according to the pattern that he gave him. And these details are very, very important. They're very important in showing us God's plan of salvation for mankind. So worshiping according to the truth of his word had already been done in the old covenant. Moses was worshiping according to the pattern, according to what God had spoken in his word, 
So worshiping in truth was already being done in the old covenant. What Jesus is saying in John chapter four is that you used to worship according to a picture, according to a shadow, according to a portrait of something that was to come. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to worship in the shadows anymore. I am the true, I am the real worship that your old tabernacle pointed to. They that worship me must worship born of my spirit and in the truth, knowing that I am the one that this tabernacle pointed to. Oh, dear Lord, I pray, rewind the tape if you have to, to get this revelation. Jesus is telling him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, telling her rather. God is giving us a new protocol. Beloved, the Bible teaches in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. Our worship is no different. It's all in him. It's all for him. You see, beloved, the tabernacle was a prophetic portrait of Jesus. John the Apostle in John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us the word became flesh and made his dwelling, his tabernacle among us. Now the word dwelling here is the same word dwelling in the Old Testament. In other words, beloved, John is telling the New Testament church, no more do we need to worship in the shadow of things to come. The true tabernacle is now here. Amen. The spirit has come. The truth has come. Jesus has made his dwelling among us. Worshiping God in truth means we now have the true, beloved, the real that the Old Testament shadow pointed to. Jesus was saying that a worship was coming that would be based on the truth that these shadows represented and that truth, beloved, was and is him. True worshipers must worship him. True worshipers must be born of him. They that worship God must worship him in spirit, born of his spirit, and in truth, where the object of their worship is Jesus Christ. This is God's protocol for New Testament worship. There is no other way. I know many teach, many say, in, with good intention, oh, there are many paths that lead to God. Beloved, there's only one way to God, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way. Jesus is what the old covenant tabernacle and the temple pointed to. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, reveals this, saying, But Christ being come as a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator 
of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Oh, shout hallelujah and shout amen. Amen. Now, beloved, I want to close this session tonight with a final reading from this chapter of Hebrews, and that is in verse 28 from the Amplified. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 in the Amplified. Even so, it is that Christ, having been offered to take upon himself and bear as a burden the sins of many, once and once for all, will appear a second time, not to carry any burden of sin, nor to deal with sin, but to bring to full salvation those who are eagerly, constantly, and patiently waiting for and expecting him. Oh, praise God, come, Lord Jesus, come, amen? Church, worship matters. How we worship, why we worship, who we worship. It matters to God, and it must matter to us. Amen. Amen. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this night in your word. We thank you, Father God, that you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that in you, Lord God, and in your word and through your word, we're made complete. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the words of John chapter 4, where you in this encounter with the Samaritan woman revealed to us the truth that they that worship God must, must worship in spirit and in truth, must be born of your spirit, must worship with a knowledge of understanding that worship points to you, that all of our effort must come through you, that we must lean on you, Lord God. We must lean on you, Lord Jesus. We must lean on you, Holy Spirit, to worship in and through us, that we may offer the sacrifice of praise from our lips and give unto you, Lord, the glory that is due your name, because it is in you that all things consist. Oh, Heavenly Father, that you would breathe upon this assembly tonight. Breathe on our hearts. Breathe on our minds. Make us what we ought to be. Give us the revelation of truth that's outlined in your word. Help us see the tabernacle. Help us see that what that Old Testament structure pointed to, that we may offer you in the proper protocol, the worship that you are worthy of, the worship that you require. Almighty God, almighty God, give us the revelation. Worship matters. Worship matters. It matters that we be present in your presence. It matters that we be engaged through the Spirit. It matters that we be connected to you by the power of the Holy Spirit through the work of sanctification and justification in the working of the Holy Spirit that is given to us through the blood of Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Oh, Lord, as we prepare our hearts looking forward to Holy Week next week, we pray, Lord God, make us what we ought to be. Transform us from the inside out, Lord, that we would hear what the Spirit of God is saying as we examine ourselves to become all that you desire and all that you require. I just sense in my heart there are those of you that may be watching tonight that 
have yet to come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know God doesn't want you dancing outside the veil any longer. The Holy Spirit of God is here to set you free, to deliver you from every bondage, the bondage of sin, the bondage of iniquity, the bondage of generational curses. The blood of Christ breaks every chain over your heart and your mind. When you come to him, when you come to the light of the world, when you come to the bread of life, when you come to the one who is the sacrifice, the only sacrifice for your sin, come to him. Turn your heart tonight to him. Come to Jesus. Give him your life. Surrender your will. Surrender your heart to him, beloved. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe upon him would have eternal life. We're sharing with you the gospel and we're praying for you tonight. So I'm going to ask the whole family of God through Faith Community Church, our Facebook family, let's set ourselves in agreement right now for that one, that one that is yet to believe. And let's believe together in agreement that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to descend upon that heart and bring healing, salvation, healing, and deliverance to your soul. Amen. So if you would like to receive Jesus, if you are ready, and you know what? Stop waiting. Now is the time to serve the Lord. And by ready, I mean you are willing to come to him to say, Lord Jesus, I humble myself. See, it takes humility. That's what I mean by the word ready here. It's a humility that you're willing to bow the knee and surrender control, surrender the, the, the reins of your heart to him and receive his love, receive his mercy, receive his free gift of salvation. If you are in that place tonight of brokenness, true brokenness before the Lord, we want you to pray with us as we pray this prayer. We're asking you, pray these words from the heart. Don't just go through the motions because it will mean nothing, but pray them sincerely and truly from your heart with the revelation of knowing Jesus is the Christ. Why? Because God's word says so. God's word says so. Jesus is the promised Messiah. There is no other. There is no other path, beloved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So come to him tonight, understanding that he took upon his back 39 whiplashes, so that you could be rid of the guilt of your sin and the shame of your sickness. He wants to take your infirmity from you, that sinful infirmity, that shameful lifestyle. He wants to remove that stain from you so that you can walk away from this meeting with a clear conscience knowing you are forgiven of every deed. If you sincerely confess it before him, you are forgiven. What a savior. So we invite you to pray along with us as we pray these words, pray them from your heart, believing that the Holy Spirit of God is here to touch you and minister to you. Amen. Would you do that with us tonight? Amen. What a wonderful time to do it right before Holy Week. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Say this after us. Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I am in need of a savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you went to the cross for me, that you took the punishment for my sin, that you, Lord Jesus, through you, through you alone, I can be saved. I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you died and rose again. On the third day, you rose again. 
With my mouth, I confess the Lord Jesus. And with my heart, I believe God raised you from the dead. Your word says, if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you are the Christ, that you rose from the dead, I shall be saved. I open up my heart to you, Lord Jesus. Come, fill my heart. I welcome you, Holy Spirit of God. Take away the heart of stone and give me a new heart, a heart soft, teachable, and moldable for you. I surrender all that I have and all that I am. Thank you for forgiving me, and thank you for making me brand new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, beloved. I, I pray you prayed that prayer sincerely from your heart. If you did, know that the angels of God are in heaven rejoicing over you. For from this day forward, you are a child of God. And this prayer, beloved, is simply an invitation to begin to follow him. And you know, you need a church. You need a church that's going to help you grow in the knowledge of his word and in the fellowship with the saints and have wonderfully blessed people who love the Lord speak into your life and walk with you. You don't have to walk this road alone. And, and let me tell you something. It's not God's will for anyone to walk this road alone. We need one another. We need the church. We need to belong to a local church body of believers. So I want to welcome you to Faith Community Church if you're looking for a home church. Our hearts, our home, our doors are open to you, beloved. And we're going to be meeting really, really soon. So this is a great time to get connected to this church family. I just want to encourage you, if you've prayed that prayer and you would like more information, uh, our elders are ready and waiting to pray with you. Just please reach out to us. You can make a comment below, or if you'd like to, you could private message us or visit our website at faithcc.com and uh, make out a contact form. And one of our church elders will be happy to minister to you, to reach out to you and to call you and connect with you. Uh, we have a gift for you and we want to pour into your life. So you're not call to do this alone. Know that you have a family that loves you and wants to walk this road with you. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad for this meeting tonight. I'm so glad that pretty soon we're going to get together again before you know it. We're, we're counting the days, church. We're now counting the days. So just hang in there. Know that it's happening. Uh, you'll be hearing from Pastor very shortly. Know that we love you and we're so grateful for each and every one of you. Those of you uh, that are part of our church family and even those who have visited, who have donated to our ministry, our church, we want you to know we're so grateful for every gift that you have sown into this ministry. You have helped us weather this storm that all of us have experienced. Amen. God has used you to help us navigate through this season and come out on the other side uh, unscathed and ready to roll. Amen. We're ready to do the will of God, the work of God on another level when we gather together we haven't stopped. We have been meeting through Zoom. We have prayer meetings throughout the week. We have life groups throughout the week. So this, you know, lockdown and, and quarantine did not stop Faith Community Church. Faith Community Church is alive and well and has been prospering and has been flourishing. And we are so grateful to every one of our church family who has helped us stay through this season and be successful in advancing the kingdom of God together. Amen. For those of you who have given online already, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for your faithful support. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your prayers and your love that you have extended to Pastor Gary, myself, and all the elders of the church. We're so grateful to each and every one of you. If you'd like to give tonight, please follow the link that we provide for you below. And we also have a text option for those of you who would like to text your offering 
just text that number to uh, to us and and we'll uh, it'll open up the, the the link that you need to uh, do that online giving. Church, we love you. We love you. We're so grateful for you. Thank you for being a part of us. Thank you for walking together with us. I know this Sunday, Pastor Gary is going to have a powerful Palm Sunday message. You don't want to miss it. It is going to be a wonderful time and worship is going to be powerful. We want to encourage you be a part of it. That's this Sunday at 10 a.m. Children's Church at 9 a.m. via Zoom. And um, I'll see you next week because next week we're going to continue with this series on Worship Matters and we're going to learn more and more about the practice of worship. So I want to encourage you to be a part of this meeting next Wednesday night at 730. Beloved, I love you. God bless you. And I'll see you next week.